or no, but it can't be both at the same time. It's either left or right. Okay, two absolutes. It can't be anything in the middle. Are there, are there true contradictions in the Bible? What would it do to our understanding of Scripture if we did accept that there are contradictions? And there are Christian groups that will accept, that will uh, uh, embrace the idea that there are contradictions in the Bible. And they have a methodology through which they will work through that understanding of contradictions. Um, our uh, uh, conviction is that when rightly understood, when carefully analyzed, if God's word is to be believed, if God's word is to be sure, there cannot be contradictions. It would destroy the underpinning of this being the word of God. Is there any contradictions with God? No. He is absolute truth. He has absolute purity. A contradiction is is uh, beyond his is not part of his nature. Um, so we would we would um, offer some methodologies for how to analyze and deal with what we might call apparent contradictions. Things that on a superficial reading, things that you might read quickly or you might not look at the whole picture or the whole context and, and, uh, and, and say, aha, or uh, tragedy. There is a contradiction. And, and uh, this is an important thing because um, if you do go down the route of saying, well, what's the big deal? I mean, what's the big deal? So what? So some numbers got crossed. And one Bible story says the number was this. And another Bible story that's the same parallel story says it's a different number. That's, it doesn't matter. But once you crack that door open, then you leave yourself open to anything. Does the resurrection matter? Well, it didn't matter over here, this little contradiction. So maybe the resurrection doesn't matter. Maybe substitutionary atonement doesn't matter. Where does it end is the question. Okay? So we're, we're going to look, and I'm just going to offer um, some, again, some methods on, and some illustrations, and we looked at a few of these already. Um, by the way, people who want there to be contradictions in the Bible will um, go to great lengths to try to twist the scriptures into saying things that it doesn't say. I had a, a guy I was studying with in California that gave me a stack of papers like this showing contradictions that he had found in the Bible. And sure. He wanted me to just disprove every one of those things, and then, and then I'll believe. And I'm like, this is probably not going to be the best Bible. Study. Yeah, if you begin with that level of cynicism and, and negativity, you know, you can create in your own mind realities yes. that aren't there. Exactly. Okay? So our, our approach is let's be humble. Okay? Let's be good students. Let's use our brain. And we want to avoid two extremes. On one, and, and, I, and I mentioned this uh, in another class, on the one, we want to avoid the simple God of the gaps thing, where we just say, well, God just does it. Okay? There will be certain things that we have to do that with. Okay? The miraculous power of God, the sovereignty of God, is something we cannot always explain. We cannot always grasp. And we just have to to bask in his shadow and say, look, if, if God can become a man, okay, if, if the incarnation can be taught in the Bible, I can't explain it, okay, so I'm not saying that. But we want to, we want to avoid the tendency just to say, well, I don't know how there could be a universal flood. It just, God just did it. Well, yeah, you can say that, but is there more in the Bible that gives us, um, uh, does God give us more tools in the Bible beyond just having to shrug our shoulders and say, well, God just did. And on the other side, we don't want to go too far. The other way of saying, well, um, because uh, so you have the, the divine side over there where it's all God. And then over here you have the, well, the, the, the author of the Bible just messed up. He just messed up. Moses got it wrong. Okay? Joshua got it wrong. He thought the sun stood still, but it didn't really stand still. Joshua just got it wrong. Okay? And those two extremes... Uh, are easy. Those are the easy ones. Okay. In any debate, it's easy just to dig your, your feet in, 
and stand on one side or the other and throw rocks at each other. But I think the Bible wants to give us, God, through the Bible, wants to give us more tools and more resources so we don't just uh, 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 lean towards either, well, God just did it, therefore I don't have to explain it, it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. And the other side saying, well, obviously, you know, the, the writer of the Bible just messed up. Okay. These all happen to be start with the letter P, which makes it um, convenient. First, we must accept the fact that within literature and within metaphor, the Bible employs lots of paradox, paradoxes, paradoxi, paradoxy, I don't know, <laughs> multiple forms of paradoxes. And a paradox is not a contradiction. A paradox is using two opposites to illustrate a point. Okay, and we looked at this um, on, on Sabbath. We can look there again. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Let's just do that briefly. If you're with me um, on Sabbath, this will be re, uh, a refresh. What verse did you say? Proverbs 24. Oh, I'll write it here. 4 and 5. Proverbs 24, oh, excuse me, 26. That will make a difference. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Old Testament. This is, this is a classic one that you'll come across in, in, in skeptical uh, books that are critical of the Bible. And then we'll say, this is, this is illogical. This is a contradiction. You know, the believer, the believing Bible student will, will say, I take exception to that. This is a paradox. It is not a contradiction. Okay, Proverbs 26, verse 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. Okay, this is wisdom literature. Okay, this is a proverb. It's, it's an illustration. It's a theme. It's a lesson. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. Leave him alone. That's the counsel. That's the wisdom. If a fool has made up his mind that he's going to do something foolish, let it be. Because you're going to get wrapped up in it. Right? That's what that lesson is there. But go to the very next verse. Verse 5. And you have the opposite advice. Answer a fool as his folly deserves, or according to his folly, that he be not wise in his own eyes. Now, did the Bible writers know that they were putting these verses right next to each other? Yeah? And all of the, the scribes that came after that copied this, and all of the, uh, 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 the, the, the centuries through which the scriptures have come down, did everyone who was transcribing this know that these were put next to each other? Did, was anyone surprised when this revelation came out that these two verses are in contradiction to one another? No. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope that rhetorical uh, attitude that I'm expressing <laughs> is clear. The answer to that is no. Uh, they knew from the beginning. That's probably a, a, most of the Proverbs are written by Solomon. Solomon probably penned it this way. Now, so you have a paradox. You, if you do answer a fool, if you try to address a fool, you're going to get caught up with the foolishness of the fool. If you do answer the fool, though, you're going to be um, um, you're going to be instructing the fool, and in that he be not wise in his own eyes. What's the point, though, of the proverb? What's the point of these two verses put together? To make you think. It makes you think. That's true. That's good. Um, at the moment, I don't see that the verse 4 says that you should not answer a fool. Okay, what do you see it say? Don't answer the fool in the same way he expresses his foolishness. That is according to the verse Okay. And the next one says, answer it in the way his father deserves. Okay. In other words, stay away from the fool. That's a very good textual way of looking at it. Very good. Other thoughts? Don't argue with a man who's got his mind already made up. Don't argue with a man. Yeah. 
And, and, and so, yeah, there are lots of different ways of looking at this, but, but probably one of the simplest things that Solomon is, is trying to illustrate is whenever you deal with a fool, it's a losing proposition. Buy it. <laughs> yeah, that just that, that that when a fool is is being foolish, there's really little you can do, and and um, you know there are different textual ways, as Jim suggests, that you can work through these things. And again, this is just a very simple paradoxes are all throughout the Bible, and, and in, in the New Testament, Jesus, there's eight significant paradoxes that Jesus himself uses. He says, if you want to be first, then you need to be last. If you want to live you must die. If you want to be rich, then you be poor. If you want to be strong, you must be weak. On and on and on. Okay? Jim? Um, verse 4 and 5 remind me of a, something one of my colleagues told us one time. He was having difficulty, uh, let's just say, uh, fulfilling his, uh, his uh, calling as a teacher with a particular student. Okay. Said um, he read that you should never try to teach the pig to sing because it frustrates the teacher and annoys the pig. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you get that? And I, I like I what hear. Ron said too. Uh, by the way, when he said some of these are just designed to make you think. Some of the Bible lessons and stories are just there to make you wrestle with challenging situations. My favorite thing is, uh, I used to do this when I was a drug counselor, was if you want to have control, you have to realize you don't have any. Yeah. Yeah, there are different, yeah, and that's again a paradox. And, 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 and uh, I, I shared this on, on, on Sabbath. Any of you in my Sabbath school class on Sabbath? Some, some of you are here. Um, I, I just like in, in literature being able to illustrate um, a paradox as well. Okay, that's a true paradox. This statement is false. Is it true? Yes, it's true, so it's false. If it's false, then it's true. Right. You understand what it means? Okay, it's a paradox. Okay, it, this this is a just a uh, 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 um, it's just, it's just rhetoric. Okay, this is an exercise in rhetoric. Okay, um, and and the, you'll find these things um, in the Bible that are designed just to kind of make you think or um, to illustrate a point. And a lot of Jesus's paradox, if you want to be first, you should be last. He's using the spiritual and the earthly to illustrate a point. If you want to be first in heaven, right, then you must be a servant. You must be last among your brethren. If you want to live in heaven, then you must die to self. All these things. It's there to illustrate a point. Okay. Second. A second tool. So first of all, when you come across what might be an apparent contradiction, ask yourself, is this just a paradox? Is it just a rhetorical tool or a way, an analysis designed to teach a point. Okay? The second one, I use the word perception. Sometimes we lack um, perspective. Okay? Perception, perspective, I guess there's different P words we could use for this. Very little in the Bible is recorded and expressed only once. Very little. Virtually all, I mean, we, I mean, just the structure of the Bible. You have an Old Testament, right? Original, first, initial testament. And it's followed by what? The New Testament. Okay? The two stories are parallels of one another. They both tell the same story of Jesus Christ as our Redeemer and Savior. Okay? But even in the structure itself, you have Samuel and Kings in the Old Testament. Virtually every major story in Samuel and Kings is repeated in First and Second Chronicles. Right? Okay? Deuteronomy, it, the, the very word Deuteronomy means repetition of the law or a retelling of the law. Duet, namas, okay? Um, 
which is just simply most of what you find in Deuteronomy comes also in Exodus and Leviticus. Okay, it's a retelling of the law. How many Gospels are there in the New Testament? Four. How many times does Paul repeat himself in his epistles? Okay, the epistles, there's a lot of repetitive things there. God gives us multiple angles of looking at the same truth so that we can have a good perspective. Okay, a, a perception, perspective. Maybe I should have used perspective instead of perception. So, um, sometimes when you read parallel accounts, certain details are described differently. And again, to the skeptic, to the cynic, to the person looking for problems, sometimes they jump on that and they say, aha, problem. But a lot of times it's because... They okay, I uh, messed up by not uh, charging my battery, leaving my camera on, and so after whatever, 13, 15 minutes, the video ran out on Pastor Dave's teaching on the contradictions, paradoxes, uh, perceptions of the Bible, and, and um, so I'm going to attempt in what took him about 45 minutes longer to sum up everything maybe in 10 minutes or so, or however long it takes, because I did take some notes, so here we go. So he was just talking about the um, contradiction of the Bible, and he covered the paradoxes, uh, he covered perception perspective and he was just about getting to um, two parallel passages in scripture the first being in first Samuel 24 and the second in first Chronicles 21 and if you'll turn with me to first Samuel 24 verse 1 it says and again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. And then in uh, 1 Chronicles 21, it says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So is it God or is it Satan? And... Um, he gave great uh, answers to how to reconcile that passage, but uh, again, I didn't take uh, adequate notes. Um, basically, um, I've got the writer of First Chronicle or Second Chronicles was Ezra, and Ezra knew of Second Samuel of the Second Samuel twenty-four passage, and he probably knew it by heart. So. Um, the second one is in verse 9 of 2 Samuel 24. Let me just read it. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So you add those, that's 1.3 million. And then you go to 1 Chronicles 21, verse 5. It's talking about the same thing. It says, And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew the sword. And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. You add those numbers, and that's 1.57 million people. So there you got, uh, you know, quite a few, uh, 300,000 or so uh, difference. And he mentioned, um, to reconcile this, he mentioned the census count in uh, Ezra, no, no, Second Chronicles 27, 23, and 24. And let me just uh, read that. But David took not the number of them from twenty years old and under, because the Lord had said he would increase Israel like to the stars of the heavens. 24. Joab the son of Zeruiah began to number, but he finished not, because there fell wrath for it against Israel. 
neither was the number put in the account of the Chronicles of King David. And so you have incomplete numbers, incomplete census. There were wars going on. There were, you know, stuff happening. So um, in my notes, I had put uh, David doubted God in Chronicles. And Samuel illustrated the permissive will of God. Uh, Satan took Job's children, etc. So, um, so there is the number. Okay, so verse uh, the first uh, supposed contradiction was God in Samuel, Satan in Chronicles. And the second one was the 1.3 million in Samuel as opposed to 1.57 million in Chronicles. And then we have a third one, and that's uh, the names. And there's um, in Samuel, 2 Samuel 24, verse 16, I'll read that. It says, And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil, and said to the angel and said to the angel that destroyed the people it is enough stay now thine hand and the angel of the lord was by the threshing place of aruna the jebusite so there we have aruna now we go back to second samuel or no first chronicles 21 verse 18 talking about the same thing and the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite so here we have Aruna or Ornan and um, he had mentioned uh, that People have middle names, more than one name, and um, and then the spelling. How many uh, how many ways are there to spell like Sarah, you know, or you know? So um, there's there's a way to reconcile that. And I apologize for uh, not being as good as Dave, uh, who is as you can see a great teacher speaker. And uh, I'm just trying to fill in the gaps here so I can move on to the next couple of weeks. He's got some more videos that I did get the whole thing of, and uh, you're going to really like it. I'm, they're, they're awesome. So, anyways, um, so the fourth one was in verse 24 of Second Samuel. Let me just read that. Second uh, Samuel 24 verse 21 through 24 so let me see and Aruna said wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant and David said to buy the threshing floor of thee to build an altar unto the lord that the plague m may be stayed from the people skipping down to 24 and the king said unto Aruna nay but I will surely buy it of thee at a price Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. So, so there it says he bought it for fifty shekels of silver. And let me just pause there because uh, Pastor Dave said, you know, he could speak a whole sermon on that verse 24. Um, there are some real precious jewels and gems in that verse. I mean... I'm just going to read it again because I'd like to hear that someday. Um, but it says, But I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doesn't cost me anything. So, yeah, that, I, I'd love to hear uh, Dave's exposition, exposition of that. But there's some important uh, gems there. So anyways, going on to um, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 25, and it says, 
So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. So, talking about the same thing here, we, we've got uh, 50 shekels of silver in the Samuel passage and 600 shekels of gold. Now that's quite a difference. Um, now, I wrote down that the silver equals the threshing floor only which is the eventual site of the Temple Mount and the gold actually was for the entire site of the Temple Mount so um, apparently that explains that and um, the basic thing of this whole point is um, God never intended this census to be a completed process um, there was different benchmarks used and the point is not the point is not the census but that you should shouldn't doubt God um, be patient be humble there's different perspectives uh, don't cast dispersions and then he briefly touches on perplexities, problems, and phenomena of the Bible. And he's going to get more into that next week, so uh, stay tuned. But, yeah, the whole point of the this census was, uh, you know, that you shouldn't doubt God. Um, to be patient, to be humble, um, and not the numbers at all. And I am so sorry that... Uh, I forgot to turn the camera off and it bled the battery down and, and so the battery ran out after didn't have time to charge it before I left and so um, yeah I uh, I really encourage you to watch uh, the video before this and then the following videos because it's just some awesome uh, teachings on, on uh, supposed contradictions paradoxes of the Bible um, and uh, and you'll be blessed so i hope you have a great uh, rest of your day and thanks for watching